Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday. I'm just going to go and see if I've got my music plan. I got the music plan. And I'm going to switch over to a different layout. So let's see. Get my monitor going. There it is. And I don't need that overlay anymore. Let me get rid of that. Hide. All right, cool. Hello, Poland. How's it going? I hope you're having a good evening. It's got to be late over there. I'm mean, going to guess it's around midnight. Hey, Korea. Cool. We've got people from all over the planet. Well, I am in LA where it is warm, as always. And uh, I'm going to play with Unreal today and maybe other stuff. And uh, I've got this little scene that I started working on last week towards the end of the stream. And I think I'm just going to keep playing with it for uh, our jam today. Um, and for you guys, hey, Ash, uh, South Africa, hello, Pyramid. Uh, yeah, so for those of you who have been here before, you know, it's pretty casual. You can ask, ask questions if you want. Um, hopefully you guys are, you know, working on your own thing. Um, I've been doing that, you know, watching the new stream with uh, Jared on Tuesdays where it's kind of nice to just work on my own thing and listen to Jared and Jared and Matt just sort of talk about what they're doing. So hopefully you guys are doing the same thing. And so, yeah, I think uh, in this environment, it's basically a simple unreal scene. And so just a lot of mega scan stuff, which is something I just made last week. And then I've got a simple camera move going on. Jared, hello. Um, happy Wednesday to you. We're almost at Thanksgiving, so I will not be doing a turkey theme like you did last night. So unless a turkey magically appears in my scene on its own. Uh, so yeah, I've got a camera move in here, but it's a bunch of mega scans assets. And that's just a sort of easy, fun thing to do because I think since I'm still getting used to Unreal, and I'm just going to go and switch to default viewport. Now, when I do that, my post-process volume is going to be a little dark. So I'm just going to go and adjust the exposure on that. Let's try 8.5. So this is a dark scene anyway. I tend to make stuff that's really dark. But uh, let's see. Do I have something in here that's slowing things down? Mm -hmm. Frame rate's a little lower than it should be, but I don't know. Let's see. That well, should be okay. Pyramid, working on an animation I've decided to call digital meta fashion, inspired by a college class. Well, the word meta is everywhere right now, so obviously you're topical using that word. But that sounds awesome. So yeah, I have seen people using Unreal to do uh, clothing-related stuff. There was a, a commercial that was made in Unreal with MetaHumans showing off some clothing over the summer. I'm going to take this light that's in here and make it a little bit brighter. I don't have something that's making it obvious where that's coming from, although I could increase the volume scattering on that light. And there you can see, well, there it is. Pretty awesome that it can just show that interactively. So let's see. What do I feel like doing today in here? Well, one thing that I haven't done in Unreal yet, in five, that I've done in four, is I haven't brought over my little fog cards. And I kind of want to, I just need more of them. Something we could do today, too, is make some. Pipe lights, what's up? Yeah, the volumetrics in Unreal are really, really cool. I know, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, because there's like, you know, basically, as long as you have uh, volume fog in your scene, because if I turn it off, you'll see this is what the scene looks like without fog. So it still looks cool. Um, all the stars are coming from an HDR. And so basically, uh, I've got an HDR in the scene. 
uh, but I disabled the fog. And then once I enable fog in Unreal, then uh, on the fog node, there's a checkbox called volumetric. And then that just makes the scene uh, have volumetric fog in it, which interacts with lights correctly. So basically this point light that's right here, if I select that light, then go to the attribute editor for it, it has an attribute on it, it's a little higher, called volumetric scattering. And that's basically how much that point light uh, contributes to the volume fog. So cool that it's just all interactive. And, you know, as some of you know, I've been watching, I started using Unreal over the summer, but it still trips me out how cool it is as far as like what you can see in real time. There's still a lot of stuff I'm getting used to. Like I still consider myself a noob with Unreal, but because uh, there's certain things that are definitely tricky, like particle effects, Niagara, which is their sort of new particle engine, is definitely something that I'd like to learn the basics of. Ash, yeah, Blade Runner. I mean, if there's a movie that makes you want to put fog in everything, it's the new Blade Runner movie. It's like the first one had some, but the new one, man, so pretty. Uh, Dune has a lot of cool fog in it, too. Yeah, one thing I don't have in my scene is I don't have any, like, uh, like there's just, like a general even volumetric fog, but I don't have, uh, like, any kind of, like, wispy fog in the scene. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's ways to do that with particles. Um, there's ways to do with volume actors, kind of using, like, the volume cloud system. But the really, really cheap way to do it, which I did in the short that I made over the summer, is to do it on cards. Um, it's cheap and it's easy. Like, it's not something that uh, takes a lot of work. So I'm going to open up a project that already has them in it. So let me go and find that. I'm just going to open that project. So I'm going to go over to, let's see here. Unreal projects, <clears throat> flow maps. I'm going to open this project up. And this is an Unreal 5 project. I already converted it. Yeah, converting older projects to Unreal 5 is definitely a funny workflow. You need to launch five first and then open the project and then tell it to convert it. But anyway, um, so in here, since I have this project open, I'm going to open the level that has the flow maps in it. All right. I think this has a sequence in it too. Let me check a look. Level sequence. It does. So let's look at this through the cinematic viewport. There we go. So yeah, so like in here, I've got a couple fall cards. So I'm going to send this over to the other scene. And uh, it looks fairly convincing. Like this to you guys probably looks a lot more complicated than what's going on. Um, because it looks like there's this sort of like snowy mist coming off this mountain, which by the way, I just saw the movie Everest a few days ago, which is ridiculous. And I don't know why anybody climbs Everest. It looks horrible, but, um, it's got a lot of this kind of stuff in the movie, but in here, what you'll see is, um, it's actually just a couple planes that have this stuff mapped onto it. And so if I select and move, you'll see it's just a cheat. It's just a flat plane that has a texture of like some clouds on it. And then I use something called a flow map. I've mentioned this on a stream like a few months ago, I think. But uh, but it's a card. So it's two dimensional. But the thing is, you can do with materials in Unreal, you can do this thing where the material kind of automatically fades out the texture as it intersects with another object. Climbing snow mountains is way different than no snow ones. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to climb a mountain that doesn't have snow on it. But uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm from Southern California, so I, I don't do well in the cold. <laughs> um, even though I think cold places look cool, like I watched a show called Katla, which takes place in Iceland and looks amazing. 
um, hype lights. I tried to use fog planes for one of my scenes before in UE5, but I was still new to Unreal as a whole, so didn't know where to start. So, well, I'm going to talk about it now, so hopefully this helps you. So this is an Unreal 5 scene. And so this card that's inside here, I've got two cards in here. So there's this one, and then there's another one back there as well. And uh, so the thing is, you just need to have the shader set up right. And so if I go to the uh, world outliner, you'll see it's literally just a plane, just like a regular Unreal plane. But in here, the material, if I double click on the material that's on it, when it loads, let me get that over so you guys can see it. I'll just stock it up here. Um, now, this is a master material, and uh, all your comments are kind of on top of it. Uh, let me see. Let me move that. So this is a master material that I made, um, or a material instance, rather, uh, just to give all the attributes that it needs to control the flow map. And so I have to go to the um, master material so you guys can see the node graph. So it's convenient to have your comments on top so I can see it on this monitor, but I'm just going to keep moving it. Uh, and this is what the material looks like. So it's something that uh, even though I made the material, like most things in learning Unreal, you kind of kit bash stuff that you learn on YouTube and on uh, things that you download from Marketplace. So if you guys are interested in setting something like this up, there's fog cards in the Goddess Temple and the Goddess Temple, which you can download for free from Marketplace. And the Goddess Temple is one of those Quixel mega scans environments. So a lot of the stuff that's going on in here um, is stuff that I grabbed from uh, the Goddess Temple, specifically this stuff. And so you'll see it has Fresnel and Depth Fade and Pixel Depth Offset. So what Depth Fade and Pixel Depth Offset are doing to the shader, to the material, are making sure that the card, the texture that's on the card, fades out if your camera gets close to it, so you don't get this harsh clip. And it also makes sure that the texture fades off as it intersects another object. And then in here, there's all this stuff. And this is the flow map. So this is the thing that's allowing a texture to make, the, uh, make it look like it's animated. Because again, if we go back out here, it looks like there's animation on this mist. And it's something that is uh, a cheat because it's not actually animated. It's like a two-dimensional texture where it uses the red and green channels to sort of offset the pixels that are on that texture. Hype lights, you took some trees from one of the medieval village scenes. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing to do. It's like there's all this free stuff on Marketplace and it's kind of there for people to use, take apart, learn, and use in your own projects. And so it's, uh, it's what a lot of people are doing. So I think from a learning perspective, obviously you want to know how to make trees yourself using something like SpeedTree or how to make rocks yourself using something like ZBrush or Photogrammetry. You want to know how to do it yourself. But it's still really fun to use assets that you can find. And if you watch something like Aaron Sims, talk that he did with Noman a couple weeks ago about his Eye of Kalanthak short, he was kit bashing like crazy stuff from Marketplace. So anyway, um, we can see inside here that there is uh, this node. And I'm not going to go right now over how to set up because like now that I have the material, anytime I need a flow map, I'm just going to use this material in a new scene. And all I need to do is swap the texture that I'm using. And so the texture that I'm using if I go inside here and move you again on this fog card, is this. And you can see, like, that's just an image I grabbed off of Google um, of just some cool looking clouds. So that texture um, basically is what's being animated. So, Declan, how well does this effect work when you rotate the camera since it's 2D? So, well, it's 2D, so you kind of need that card to be facing the camera. Obviously, if you see it from the side, it's going to be thin. So this is good for things that are a little further away. And so if I go back to my scene that I'm going to be adding it into, so, so meaning this scene. So if I'm putting it like in the midground or in the background, I'm going to be all right. And so meaning like back there by those mountains or, or those big rocks, whatever they are or in the mid ground back there, but I wouldn't put it like on the ground in the near ground. 
Um, unless my camera is only going to be doing a very simple camera move. Because if I'm making a cinematic and my camera is just going to be moving, let's say, I'm getting a little bit of lag, which is frustrating. It's weird. Sorry, guys, but my mouse just decided to disappear. So let me try and figure out what's going on with that. Weird. Okay, now it's back. All right. So, yeah, if it was going to be something that was uh, going to be like on the ground, then really close to the camera, there's other ways to do it with particles. That would be better. Um, Ash, for portfolios, I recommended making yourself, but for learning is way better to use other assets. Imagine learning composition and having to do a whole scene from scratch just for this. Yeah, for your portfolio, it's better to have things that you made yourself, right? And so, like, since I'm not working, like, for me doing personal work, I can use whatever technique I want. For people doing professional work at a studio, there's nothing wrong with using assets that you get off of Turbo Squid or Mega Scans or whatever. Um, but for somebody trying to get a job, like as a student, graduating and putting a reel together, uh, you want to have everything in your reel be stuff you made. So, because kit bashing a scene using Mega Scans, for example, or kit bash 3D stuff, is fun, but it doesn't really tell people if you're able to model or texture or make materials or whatever. And that's what people need to know that you can do. So. If this was a scene where I had photogrammetry scanned all of these rocks and retopologized them in ZBrush and um, textured them with Mixer and all that kind of stuff, then that would be fine as a portfolio piece. So it really depends on what you're going for. But if you just say that you want to be an in-engine lighter, you know, like your interest is just lighting, then that's where it'd be okay to be using a bunch of mega scan stuff because you're not trying to sell yourself as a modeler. So, yeah, hype lights. The problem is that it's hard for people to know what you made and what you didn't, you know? And so if you show something, so it's better to have a portfolio be something that's predominantly your work. And if you're going to show something that's kit bashed, be very, very clear in your portfolio of what you did. So, yeah, so I'm going to go back to the flow map project. So you can see kind of what's going on. So let's try and get this over into my scene. And so basically I just need to go to the content drawer on my project and then I can migrate stuff from one project to another. And so you just, the one thing is that for Unreal 5, you can, you can only migrate from five to five. You can't migrate like from a four to six project to a five project. Um, so first you have to convert your 426 project to a 5 project, and then once it's an Unreal 5 project, then you can migrate from 5 to 5. So since I have this as a 5 project, then I can go to my flow maps folder, which has the materials and the textures. And then I can right click and then just click on migrate. And it's going to ask what you want to migrate. And so it's going to sort of show the stuff that's basically what is inside that folder. And then when I hit save, it's going to sort of clarify all of the individual assets that are going to be migrated. And I can say OK. And then I need to go to the content directory of the project I want to send it to. And when I select that folder, then I can say yes. And it just migrated the flow maps from this project into another project. Um, have I ever, have you ever been inspired by anime? Like that cliche that everyone says, Studio Ghibli movies. I wouldn't say I was ever inspired by Studio Ghibli, Ghibli movies, even though I love them, but anime for sure. You know, what more like stuff like Ghost in the Shell and Akira, like the darker stuff. Um, and so I'm definitely a big fan of that genre but the style isn't necessarily linked with my art style but at the same time like i just watched all right i'm going to close this project and let's see if that stuff's in here okay so now i have a folder called flow maps in this project so i migrated over um i just watched a movie a couple nights ago called shadow 
don't know if you guys have seen it, but Shadow is the guy who made House of Flying Daggers and Hero, and which are both insane movies, which you should all see if you haven't. And Shadow is a little slow, but visually it's really cool. Like, really cool. I actually did like a bunch of screen grabs while I was watching it. Well, not screen grabs because Apple doesn't let you do screen grabs when you're watching a movie from on an Apple TV. But uh, I took pictures with my phone. I don't know if I have them on my... I don't know if I copy them. No, I don't want Bing. Why do you think I ever want Bing? Uh, let me try and open this up. Let's go to E. Reference library. I have not copied it to this computer yet. I'm going to grab it. Uh, let's see. Reference, reference, reference. I'm looking on another monitor right now. There it is. All right, so that just downloaded. Let me unzip it. And let me go in there. Hopefully these will open on this computer. Because these are stills. There we go. Here we go. <clears throat> so these are just like, you can see I literally took a picture of my laptop. This is just like a couple nights ago, but uh, it's got some scenes that are crazy. Just really, really cool cinematography. And the whole movie is, uh, it kind of has like a black and white sort of vibe to it. So it's just a very, very low saturation on the movie. It's like mostly just skin tones. But uh, I had to do some screenshots because it was just so cool. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? It's so beautiful. So Chinese movie. And uh, really, really, really pretty. So I don't want to give away too much stuff by showing all these screen grabs but you get the idea that's pretty striking so yeah that's shadow it's a little slow so i think it's definitely one of those movies that'll get better like second time you watch it all right so i'm gonna go and see if i can get some of those cards in here so i'm gonna create a plane All right, so now I've got this little plane and all you need to do is assign the material. So, so obviously this isn't necessarily a tutorial from scratch on how to set this stuff up. Like I could always make one one day, but that wouldn't really be for a stream. That would be more like a pre-recorded thing. So if I take one of these materials, I've got the master material and two material instances because I have two different cloud textures and that's something where I want to make more. So if I go and select one of these and assign it to this plane. Okay. Uh, let me just rotate that. That one, there we go. So hopefully you guys can see that this is now in here. I just need to rotate it, uh, probably that way. So now I've got this plane that has this animated texture on it, this animated via the flow map. And then to get it to match the scene that I would, might modify the color, its opacity and stuff. But first I wanna figure out where to put it. And one thing that hopefully you can notice is that like where it intersects with the ground isn't like a hard line. And that's because of the shader using the 
um, depth fade and pixel depth offset is causing that texture to fade out. It's pretty cool. So I'm gonna put this further back in the scene. So if you guys saw that short rebirth, it's really, really cool. That was made by the Quixel guys. Um, there's a lot of fog cards in there. And so as far as the image you put on the fog card, you might put work making that. You could make it with Embergen, Houdini, Maya. You could paint it in Photoshop. But basically, like it now gives me this kind of wispy stuff on the ground in the background, but it's really cheap. So um, that's in there. So I'm going to rename it. And so let's call that plain underscore fog. And then I'm going to alt drag to copy it. Put another one in the scene, see if I can get away with having the same one, but rotated differently. Yeah, Rebirth is awesome. Do you guys hear the music, by the way? Like, I hear it, but it's, it's really low for me, so, because I don't want it to be too loud but I'm not sure if the music is streaming out. All right, cool. Thanks, Andy. So yeah, so like now I've got two of those fog cards in here <clears throat> and you can see that, you know, if they're gonna be back there, they're fine that they're 2D, you know, like I can still move my camera around and it's not an issue. I'm going to get this point light that's right here to not be contributing to the fog so much. There we go. It's a little bright. Um, so yeah, it's like the fog cards are... Here, I'm going to get your comments out of the way. So hopefully you guys agree that like the fog cards on the ground... I mean, I can lower their opacity a little bit. But they look cool, and if you look at them, you know, you can tell that there's movement on them. So what I really need is just a bigger library of those things. And as far as, like, if I wanted to make them so that, like, they're not so opaque, then I can just adjust the material. And so if I select, let's say that one that's over there, and selecting them can be kind of tricky because it's going to want to select the rocks. And so that's why I named them in the world outliner so they're easier to find. Um, but yeah, if I go to the material, then I'm just going to drag that into here. Then on the, uh, I can't do it that way because I need to see. So on the material instance, And usually I have this on a second monitor, but just so you guys can see. So I added an attribute or a parameter. Um, it's a funny thing with switching from Maya to Unreal. It's just getting used to lingo. But I added a parameter that's called emissive intensity. And so because the texture that's on those fog cards is uh, emissive. And uh, so basically if I go to the emissive intensity, and lower that down, let's say to 0.5. If you look on the left where that fog is right there, and maybe I'll get a little bit closer to it so it's easier for you guys to see. Okay, so if I go to it and I put that to one, so you can see that it's a lot brighter. But if I go to the emissive intensity and put it down to 0.5, then I can just get that to blend in a little better with the scene lighting, depending on what I want. So, yeah, I'd like to have some more though. Uh, Peter, this is Unreal. Yeah. What software do you use, Peter? 
So, Ash, I'm glad you think it looks cool. So, yeah, obviously, if I went and, you know, got a bunch of these in the scene, before I go and make a new one, let's just grab the other one that I haven't used yet. So I'm going to grab Plain Fog 2. I'm going to put that in here so it's easier to see. But I'm going to grab the other material that I have, because I have a couple. I'm going to assign that one. You're learning ZBrush. Awesome. Lightwave and Fusion Resolve. Lightwave, I haven't heard that mentioned in a while. Is Lightwave still updated? I remember years ago, a lot of the Lightwave developers left and created Moto. Uh, Rick, that is not a scan of myself. I'd like to have a scan of myself. That would be cool. That's a scan I got from uh, Render People which is a website that has uh, tons of scans of people. And there's also a 3D scan store, which is really cool. It has a lot of really, really nice scans. Becklin, you're learning Unreal in the virtual production class. Awesome. The class with Dane. That class looks really cool. Yeah, there's... Uh, a couple places in LA where you can get scans made that uh, there's General Giant and then there's a truck like this scan truck to drive around scan people it's just full of cameras all right so I just put another one there and then I'm gonna now, okay I don't know what's going on with the bagpipes they're as out of place as they were in Dune I'm going to move that one back out there. Oh my God, more backpipes. No. Let's see this one. I'm going to scoot over there. Scale this one bigger. Kind of rotate them so they're kind of facing the camera. We do a Nomen degree online. Uh, we do not, now that we're reopened, now the campus is reopened, everything's uh, on campus. So we have individual courses that are online, but not the full-time programs like the degree. Uh, we have no intention to ever offer an online degree because while being online was fine for COVID and thank God for the internet and getting us through COVID, I hate online education. People don't get to know each other and you need to get to know each other and make friends and that's important like more important than you probably realize and i think for a lot of people over covid that became clear but uh, i just think an in-person education is a million times more valuable and so for Nomen, that's what we want to do so not to say there aren't places out there that are doing a good job online and more power to them um, and i know for a lot of people that's the only choice that you have it's just not something that i'm really all that interested in. Boston campus. I've never been to Boston. I'd really like to go one day. All right, so I'm going to switch to my cinematic camera, which is going to force me to have to adjust my post process exposure. So now what I'm doing is I switch so that I'm looking through my actual render cam that I would render animations from. So I can hit play. And so as this is playing, I can now see, okay, that point light is kind of starting to, I'm gonna 
reduce the intensity of glow even more. So hopefully you guys can now see that kind of ground fog stuff back there. And I don't know on the stream quality if you can notice that it's moving, that it has like a slight movement to it. And again, the nice thing is that it's it's from a technical perspective, it's not that hard. You know, like the material is crazy. And uh, I could always potentially just share the material with you guys. I'd have to figure out like if there's a way I can add a link um, into once this goes up on YouTube, just to the material, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, and so would need a reminder. So, you know, any of you are welcome to like ping me on Instagram. Isn't there a way for me to like show my Instagram? There it is. Is that going to work? Um, although my Instagram is, I need to change the name on it. It's Alvarez, but with a whole bunch of underscores. So it's got eight underscores. So it's at Alvarez and then eight underscores because Alvarez was taken and then an Alvarez with one underscore or two underscore. I mean, it's, anyway, so, but if you ping me there, um, you guys are more than welcome to uh, DM me on Instagram and as a reminder, and just so that uh, I would be happy to share that uh, flow map material because it took a while to figure out how to get that working right. I know it's, it's, it's way too many. Um, since Noman has a BFA now, are there any plans for an MFA in the future? There are not. The reason for that is dumb. Um, the reason is because when we went from vocational to um, degree, it meant that all of the teachers in the degree would need to have a degree. And uh, which we did research into our instructors and it turned out 80% of our instructors had a degree. And so because of that, it wasn't so bad. And so meaning that we were able to have simultaneously our vocational program and our degree program, all the teachers in the, you know, if, if we had a degree or a teacher who didn't have a degree, they could still teach in our vocational program. And obviously there's a lot of working professionals that are awesome that don't have degrees. And then for the BFA, they have to have a degree. But for an MFA, for a master's degree, the teachers need to have a master's. That's a problem trying to find enough teachers that are working in production, meet Noman standards, are really awesome, talented artists, and have a master's is a lot harder to find. And that's why Noman does not have a master's degree. And so, and probably won't. So yeah, because I mean, having a master's would be cool. So for students who already have a degree who would love to have a master's. So like if we could take our two-year program not the BFA four year, but if we could take our two year and just convert that to a master's, that would be cool and makes sense because a lot of the students that are in the two year have a degree. And the reason they're doing the two year is because they don't need the four year degree. But uh, it's just a limitation. It's a rule set by the accrediting agency. Okay, so I've got that ground fog back there and it's fine. I'd like to have another card. So I'm going to make one and then you guys will kind of see how this is made. Ash, can I put it on chat? Not right now. I'd rather do it later because to share it, I kind of need to figure out the right way to sort of package that up. Um, with the placement rate of Noman, what difference would it make if MFAs were offered? None. I mean, it, that's the thing. It, it's not important. I think it's more that some people would find it cool to get a master's degree. Um, if you have a master's, it makes it easier to teach at universities that in master's programs of other universities. But anyway, yeah. Um, how good are Bogdan? How good are Unreal's animation tools? Do you think it has potential to be at least as close to mine production anytime soon? For character animation, they've added a lot of stuff for that. Yeah. So I think for character animation, you're fine. Uh, they've added control rig. All right, I'm going to switch back to my default viewport. Now it's going to get dark again. So I'm going to go, I'm sorry, sometimes when I start answering questions, I kind of lose my train of thought on what I'm doing in the project. Uh, yeah, Rick, I agree. Getting a job is much more important than having a master's. 
you know, the bachelor's is different because bachelor's for some people is important if you want to work internationally. Like if you're international and you want to work in the U.S., it's a lot easier to get a work visa if you have a degree. That's the main reason. Studios don't care. But they do care if they have to get you a work visa. Because if you're a junior, it's hard to get a visa without a degree. All right. So to make another one of these fog cards, I'm going to go show you how that works real quick. So I've mentioned before, but if you uh, Google Flow Map Painter, it'll take you to this website. So, <clears throat> so tech artist, and basically, let me just make sure nothing's playing back there. All right. So Flow Map Painter is free. And so this is basically something that you can use to make flow maps because the thing in Unreal that's causing the animation on that uh, mist back there is basically these uh, textures that look funny. So if I load one up so you guys can see it, bring it over here. So this is a flow map. So we can see there's the red channel and the green channel, and there's nothing in blue. So you can see it's using red and green. And so it's using the red and green to basically offset the pixels and make it look like the texture is animated. Um, and so really the thing is, okay, well, how do you make a flow map? I've seen a couple things online where people like have flow map painters in engine, like in Unreal. Um, I think maybe it was with Fluid Ninja, but uh, I haven't used those. And so, to create one of these textures, basically, if you go and look at this program, where to go? Um, download this; it's free, and so, um, and it allows you to interactively paint flow maps, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to launch it. So Augusto, thank you. Oh, I'm getting that thing again where my mouse is acting funny. It's funny, when I switch from Unreal to another program, sometimes my mouse gets stuck. Let me try and unstick it. There we go. All right, so I'm going to launch Flow Map Painter, which is somewhere. OK. So this is Flow Map Painter. And so basically in here, this is like the default texture because you can use flow maps to make things like uh, like get water to move. And you'll see like if I increase the radius on the brush and I just paint, uh, you can see what it's doing. So you guys have seen these like on Instagram, like there's uh, some uh, image manipulation tools that allow you to like sort of draw lines on an image and it kind of brings the image to life. It's the same idea. And this has been around for a while. Um, and uh, so it's pretty cool. So if I clear the flow map, you've got different modes inside here. So if I hit two, then you can see it's going to cause stuff to move out from the center. Um, if I hit three and make the brush a little bit bigger, then I can get things to spin. And so they're kind of spinning clockwise. And let's clear that. And then if I just go back to normal paint mode, then can do that. So for something like water, if you had a texture on a plane and you wanted the water to like, you know, move in a specific direction, like around a rock, it's kind of like a way people have cheated that kind of stuff in games before. But it works pretty well on, uh, like fog cards. And so that's kind of what's going on inside my scene. So what I'd want to do is load in a texture so that I can basically uh, make my own. So the first thing is you we I need, since I only have two of these in my scene, I kind of would like to have more. I thought it'd be something to do. Uh, Pyramid, Flow Map Painter is free. So, so yeah. As far as learning Houdini, well, that's a whole much more complicated thing than downloading Flow Map, Flow Map Painter. So I'm going to find an image of smoke that we can use. 
I am sure Blender would have an add-on for this. Of course it would. So I'm going to go and try and see. Now I've got a bunch of clips, like video clips of smoke. I'm thinking I could probably grab one of those. Let me see. Yeah, I'm going to launch. Let's see. Well, I guess I'm going to launch Premiere to do this. Okay, so. Oh, okay. There we go. Where'd it go? So I was playing with this earlier. So <clears throat> I loaded a clip, but I didn't actually make the flow map yet. I just wanted to look on my hard drive to see if I had these clips. And so in here, you can see that I basically loaded a quick time of some smoke. And so if I hit play, that's what the quick time is. Now I could obviously load the video into Unreal, but the issue is that's gonna be a lot more memory intensive because at 24 frames per second, if it's 10 seconds long, then that's 240 frames at HD. That's uh, would have to be loaded into memory. And so for this clip, if I go into import and premiere, so this is a library of HD smoke, meaning 1080p that I bought a while ago, a few years ago. It's called Final Light Smoke HD. And there's a lot of companies where you can get this stuff from. And so that's where I got it. Obviously you could find uh, videos of smoke on uh, YouTube and rip it. So let's try the media browser and see if that's going to work for us. So I'm going to go to sequences, final light smoke. And I'm just going to double click on these. And then they're just going to play. And so what you're seeing on the left is me just sort of previewing some of these clips. So like for something like this, I could just take a still and kind of cheat animation on it using a flow map. I'm just going to scan comments just to see if I didn't miss anything. Nope. All right. So here I'll make this a little bigger. I don't know which one I'm going to use, so I'm just going to like go through these for a little bit. Well, I'm not looking for that kind of smoke. I'm just looking for something that's going to be more like mist. So I'm just going to Well, the thing is I could actually use something like this because if I could just go into one of these frames I could use this as a mist card because I could rotate it 90 degrees. And that could be fine. Although, let me see what, let's see, this is 03. All right, let's see. I don't know what resolution this is. So it's because it has two. One of them is going to be low res and one's going to be high res. Properties. This one is 1K, 1080 by 1080. That's fine. So let me delete that. Bring that in here. Okay, so now I've got that loaded. Let's look at that at 100%. So I'm going to take one of these and then in Premiere, I can just do a uh, export frame. And so, because it's possible off one clip, I could get multiple uh, fog cards out of it. Meaning like I could export this frame and export this frame and export this frame. Suddenly sounding very Tim Burton movie. Trying to decide what frame I want. 
Let's try that one. Okay, I don't want a harpsichord though. Okay, so I'm going to export this frame. I'm going to export it as a PNG. To my downloads directory, that's fine for now. So I'm going to call this mist underscore a. Yeah, that's kind of dumb. What I'm going to do is I'm going to name it. I'll let it stay named from where it's coming from. And I'll change it to a PNG. So I've got that one. And then now that I've got that, I need to load, load it in Photoshop. And then in Photoshop, I'm just going to darken the edges of this a little bit. And then image size, this thing, I'm going to make it 1024 by 1024 instead of 1080 by 1080, just a weird size. And I'm going to flip this thing clockwise. So there's one. And then I'm going to go back to the media browser and look around at some other ones. All right. Import, that's 06 HLA. So, yeah, Rick, these are <clears throat> like getting asset libraries is always really, really useful. You know, sometimes they can be expensive, but saves you a lot of time. All right, I'm going to export that one. Export frame. So that is now 06. In place. All right, so we've got those two, and we'll see if they work okay. Uh, Augusto, do I follow the same technical principle for the effect of rain? No, rain you can do in 3D. Like rain is um, a lot easier to just do as a 3D particle effect. So that's what I would recommend. All right, so, all right, so again, this is a scene that we're working on, trying to make some more fog cards for. Got some in the background, but I want some more. So I'm going to launch Flow Map Painter again. And it's like when I stream, I close my doors, and my computer is so hot with the graphics cards in it that it just literally heats this room up like crazy when I close the doors. All right. So back to flow map. So I need to grab the texture I want to use, which is in my downloads directory. So I need to, it's kind of weird. Flow map painter doesn't have like a regular browser. So 
you actually have to like put the path of the image um, where it says custom texture path, you have to manually put in the uh, path and then you can load it and then I'll set it not to tile it. Okay. So there's the one that we made as a frame grab. And then I'm going to lower the strength on my brush and I'm just going to do that. So that's way too strong. So I'm going to lower the strength even more. Let's see, let's get that out of there. So I'm sure it's pretty subtle for you guys to see because it's kind of small. But I'm basically just trying to uh, get some movement in here. So I've got my strength really low. Uh, it's more like a normal map, the flow map. And so if I let's see, I think there's a way to do, 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 do. that's the flow lines. There you go. So that's what the flow map's gonna look like. So it's just a red green map. And that's what's gonna turn the determine the offset of the pixels that are inside here. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Although it's definitely, it's an old program, so it's a little bit finicky. But if I choose to save this now, so bake the texture. And then I have to specify where I want it to go. And that's not uh, where I want it to go. I want it to be this name. Let's see, I'll call it that underscore flow map. Bake the texture. OK. So that just baked out this image. That goes with this guy. And then in Unreal, we can load that texture. So I'm going to go in here and my content drawer. So <clears throat> if I look at the textures that I already have in here, let's say like the smoke puff, here's one I already have. And so this we can see is just, uh, this is a 2K one, not 1K, but I'm not really getting this to fill my screen. So 1K is fine. And uh, so this one is 2K and there's nothing really changed on it. It's all sort of default settings. So I'm going to go and import this other one. I'm just concentrating to make sure I don't do something dumb. Yeah, I, I know I did one in Photoshop, but I didn't open the other one. So that's A. Let's open B. Okay, so this one I'm also going to rotate 
clockwise. Image size it, also make this one 1024. And then for this, I'm gonna flatten it. I'm gonna make sure both of these are flattened. And then I wanna make sure that black is black. So I'm just gonna hit the levels tool and then hit the little black eyedropper and click on the background just to make sure that black is black. which is a useful thing to know. All right, so I've got A and B. So I'm gonna import those in here, and those are in my downloads folder, A and B. Import. Downloads, those two textures, okay. So these two just loaded in as PNGs. So there's that one. And that one. And so now what I need to do is make a material that's using them. And so I'm going to go and uh, go over here. So this is my master material, again, the one that has all the nodes. And so for the master material, um, I basically want to make an instance of it. So it's like a copy that's related to this original. So I'm going to go select it, right click, create material instance, and then name it as MI for a material instance. And for this one, I'll call it fog card. And this one is for the texture, let's say SM006. Because that's the texture that's going to be on this guy. And then on that material instance, I can specify what I want to use. So I'm going to use all of the attributes. And I'm going to need to load in the flow map for it and the texture for it. So the texture for it is going to be this guy, SM006. Chaos Over, the song in the background. I'm listening to a Spotify playlist, which is like Twitch-friendly mu friendly music, and it's called uh, Twitch Safe Fantasy Music. So if you look up on Spotify, you'll find this playlist. So the track that's playing right now is uh, Spring Dance by Celestial Eon, Aeon Project. All right, so I'm going to specify that as the texture being used. for both spots. All right, now I'm gonna grab one of my fog planes. So we can grab that one. And I'm going to bring this one a little closer to us so it's easier to see. And I'm going to assign that material, <clears throat> which is this one. Okay. So now it's assigned, but since I made a copy of the material instance, I can see that the default settings on the material instance have the flow map moving way too quick. I also need to load in the flow map that I made, the flow map painter. Looks cool though. It's just not the look we're going for. So uh, in flow map painter, the flow map I made is, didn't I export it? 
Okay. So this is that flow map. I want to bake it out. That's going to, oh, that's why. It went into a different directory than I was expecting. There it is, okay. Now, one thing that's weird with Flow Map Painter, just so you guys know, is that uh, Flow Map Painter imports things upside down. So the flow map that it creates is upside down. So I need to load the flow map that's uh, that I made in Photoshop. And uh, which is going to be in the downloads folder, flow map painter, flow map painter data. And there's the flow map. Okay. Oh, man. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to skip those backpipes. Or I'm going to go look through here. Just scroll back a little bit. All right, so I've got the flow map, and I'm going to flip it vertically and save it. So it's just, I don't know why Flow Map Painter does that, like why it uh, imports things upside down. So since it imports your image upside down, the flow map you're creating is upside down, so you need to flip it vertically. So if I go in here now under textures, I can exactly, it's a feature. Uh, I'm going to import that flow map, which I can also do by just dragging it. Okay, so there it is. And so now on the material that's on this fog card, I can specify the flow map that I want to use which is going to be this one. OK. But now on the material instance, I need to slow it down. So flow speed. So on my material instance, I have different attributes. <clears throat> so emissive intensity, flow speed, uh, fog fade distance, how much it fades when it intersects with geometry and so forth. So I'm gonna go to the flow speed that's on this and just lower it down. So if I put it to zero, Then it's just going to move a little bit slower. That's not what I want. Flow speed 0.1. Yeah, so like I'm not really digging how this is looking. So I may need to go back to Flow Map Painter. But you know what, for now, I'm going to go and lower the emissive intensity on this. I just want to see what it looks like further back in the scene. I just realized that I lost my chat window. Where'd that go? Okay, there it is. 
chat window. Let's move you. Hey, Adam. Happy almost Thanksgiving weekend to you. All right, this is too hard to see. Now this looks funny. So I'm gonna go and look at my master material. It's been a little while since I looked at the master material for this. So I'm just gonna check out on the master material where the flow map is loaded, which is right there, which is a parameter. So you can change which flow map you're using. And so I'm trying to understand why on my material instance, I'm going to move this out of the way. <clears throat> on my material instance, why it's got flow map and texture A, because I don't want texture A. I just want the flow map and albedo. Kiara, hello from Bali. Awesome. Um, how steep is the learning curve for Unreal? I think it depends on what you want to do in Unreal. <clears throat> if you're going to use it as scene assembly, where you're making stuff somewhere else and just assembling that stuff in Unreal. You know, there's some decent learning material in the uh, free online learning from Epic. There's a good, like, 101, like, Unreal 101 course. It's a couple hours long just to get used to navigation. But I did something called the Unreal Fellowship. And the Unreal Fellowship was like a crash course five week. And in five weeks, I was able to feel comfortable enough just to be able to bring in models that I textured somewhere else and do lighting layout and be able to make like a little animation. So I would say the thing that I'm not comfortable with really like the particle engines in Unreal not really comfortable with that. Texture A and texture B. Those have to be the same. Okay. Got it. Okay. Just trying to remember how this material works. So you're using this guy, Mist B. Okay. There we go. Now it looks better. Sorry about that. I haven't used this material in a little while. And basically what I forgot to do is that on the material, it specifies the texture that we made in Photoshop that we grabbed from Premiere. You have to t specify it twice, um, which I probably should redo the material so that you don't have to do that and just specify it once and it gets used in both places. But that's because on the flow, you can see that that texture is called twice. It's lerping. A lerp is like a blend where it blends between texture A and texture B based on an alpha. And then the alpha that's inside here is uh, basically being driven by phase, which is animated. And so that's what's causing the animation. So you have to make sure that the same texture is being used twice as it determines how to blend between the two, which is not the best explanation. But point is, on the material, make sure that you put the texture that you're using in both texture A and texture B. And then your flow map goes there. And so since I only did it on once, it was looking wrong. And now it looks correct. So if I take that dude and go to the emissive intensity, you can kind of see it back there, which, you know, we can zoom up to it. So again, it's just a static texture that's got like fake animation on it that's coming from this flow map. 
And if you stare straight at it, it looks weird. But if it's something that's like in the background, as like ground fog, it works all right. Let me find a place to stick this one. So I'm sure some of that was a little confusing and I apologize for that. All right. And then the speed at which it's playing, I can control too, because it's moving a little quickly. And so I've got a attribute on my material called flow speed. So if I put that to like one, this thing is going to be, yeah, well, that's too high. It kind of disappeared. But we can see at, let's say, too high a number, you can see how it starts to look bad. I mean, it looks cool if you're doing like effects animation, but that's not what we're doing. So that could obviously be a cool look for like a portal or a portal gate door thing. But for us, flow speed needs to be a much smaller number so that it's not looking quite so odd. So I'm going to move this off to the side just so we can just so you can see it a little bit better. So I don't want that to be moving so strongly. So that's another thing that's cool since you can adjust the flow speed in here. But you don't have to worry too much about what the speed was when you were painting it in Flow Map Painter. And then again, I always want to look at it from the, where my camera is going to be. So flow speed 0.05. That's getting closer to what it should be, 0.04. Right. It's not bad. So we made one. And then, you know, this guy is something that I can definitely reuse because I could rotate it 180 degrees and see the bottom of it because we did something that's kind of a smoke puff. So if I take this one and I duplicate it, and rotate it 180 degrees, I should be able to get away with using it somewhere else in the scene without you being able to tell that I'm doing that. And maybe I'll bring this one a little bit closer. Switch to world space. Bring this one closer to us. So just a little subtle ground fog coming off the ground right there. <clears throat> now, if I wanted this one to be more opaque than the other one, I'd have to, I'd have to be careful because like this one looks a little, like I'd like it to be a little bit uh, more opaque. But if I change the material to make it more opaque, it's also going to affect the one that's over there. So I'd have to make a copy of the material if I wanted this one to be more opaque. Also just uh, raise it up a little bit. Yeah, that looks kind of cool. So again, this scene, when we started, didn't have any fog cards in it. So you know, we're just slowly starting to populate the ground. But you know what I have not done? Which is really dumb. I haven't saved. Save. Don't forget to save. Because even though Unreal, like, it's weird. Unreal, like, gives you this pop-up that says that it's saving, like, every so often. And it doesn't seem very helpful because if Unreal crashes, relying on those saves is problematic. So you are much better off 
making sure to remember to save than relying on the auto saves. That's something they mentioned in the fellowship. Um, was uh, do not rely on auto for auto save to save your butt if you forget to save. Bad idea. So I'm just going to rotate this guy around. Add another one. The ground is starting to look a little bit foggy, misty. I think I'm going to take one of my earlier ones, make a copy. This over here. We still have another one that we made that we haven't used yet. Uh, Rick, this is not, this is just for our jam, just messing around. <clears throat> Part of learning Unreal, uh, to be honest, so like if I was going to say what's the larger project, it's learn Unreal. And so by doing these exercises uh, in Art Jam, it's kind of been useful for me to get comfortable, you know, because that's one thing that I think, you know, I'm sure there's a range of, 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 people in here, you know, with you guys that as far as some of you maybe have been doing 3D for a year and some of you have maybe been doing it for, you know, 25 like I have. And it doesn't matter how long you've been doing 3D, you're always going to feel like you don't know anything because the tools keep changing and new stuff keeps coming out all the time, which is awesome. You know, like I'm super excited about Unreal, but, you know, things change and then you have to learn new stuff. So you're in this constant state of learning. So it can be a little overwhelming, you know, um, but if your, you know, interest is making artwork, whether it's for movies or video games or personal work, but when, whenever tools get, you know, new tools come out, it's just really, you switching to them is because there's something about that tool that's going to make your life easier. So that the time it takes to learn it, you're going to get back. You know, so like for lighting, for example, lighting is so much faster in Unreal than it is using a traditional offline renderer. So that's where a lot of time is saved. And not only that, rendering, right? So like if I decided I wanted to render this out as an animation, you know, so like switch to my camera that's in my scene, switch to the cinematic viewport. Then I need to go to sequencer. So I'm going to open my sequence for this guy, which I thought I had open. Yeah, save. There it is. So this is Sequencer. And so Sequencer is for Unreal, where you basically set up animations. Um, it's where you have a timeline. Uh, so like Unreal by default, um, you know, there is no like, there's time, but it's not like there's a timeline like in Maya when you launch Maya and you look at the bottom, there's always a timeline. So to get a timeline in Unreal, you have to open Sequencer and you can have multiple timelines in Unreal. It's like parallel universes because you could have like an entire short film created in a single project in Unreal. So like shot one, shot two, shot three, shot four could all be a different sequence. Anyway, so I've got Sequencer open the only thing that's in sequencer is my camera because that's the only thing that's animated. And so if I go and look through that camera, um, you can see that for the camera that's in here, I've got uh, just a couple keyframes on it, one at frame uh, one and another one at frame 240. So I'm working at 24 frames per second. So frame 240 is 10 seconds, right? So one nice thing is I can get sequencer off to my other monitor and now that I'm looking through my camera as it is in sequencer, I do need my camera has a normal lens on it, meaning things like depth of field are going to work in f-stop. So I need to adjust the exposure on it. So I'm going to bring that down a little back to what it looked like. And so 
by switching from the default viewport camera to what's called a cine camera. So if I go to create cinematic, you'll see cine camera actor. So the cine camera in Unreal is the camera you can use that you can animate, render animations from, and since and that's the camera that has depth of field enabled on it. So inside here we'll see for this camera that right now it's locked because that's the camera that I'm looking through. There we go. So you'll probably be able to notice in here that like let's say I get close to my dude. I can choose what I want to focus on. So Pixel Venture, constant learning is truth. You learn how to do explosions in Dini like five different ways now. All good though, since tech is getting closer to artists and having to deal with tech integration. Yeah, same with me. Like I've learned how to do the same thing in different tools many times. And on one hand, it's frustrating, but on the other hand, I like using learning new programs. So like I know like right now is my time for trying to learn Unreal and get comfortable, but eventually I'll get there and it'll be empowering. Um, Ash Blossom, you really like Art Jam. Cool. I think it's really important to do something just for fun because you get so heavy by learning that sometimes you forget why you were learning all this stuff. No shit. You know, you got to remember that you're doing this for fun. I think a lot of Noman students, you know, get so bogged down by all the projects they have to do for all their classes that you can forget that this was that you went to Noman to have fun and that this is a career that is cool and is fun and you are going to enjoy yourself and uh and you shouldn't take it so seriously but stress is something that you know we're all kind of insecure and introverted it's normal but uh so yeah remembering to do projects for fun sometimes is really important um doing a personal project where you just feel like i'm not going to show this to anybody i'm not going to post this on instagram i'm just going to do it for fun all right what was i talking about so this camera has depth of field so the cine camera so you can see if i move your comments out of the way and i look, select the cine camera actor and so that's going to be in here in the world outliner then if i scroll i can click on this little manual focus distance and it's got a little eyedropper and i can click on what i want to be on focus so now you'll see <clears throat> my character is in focus but the background got pulled out of focus and so that is because I'm now looking through the cine camera. And so just the fact that I have volumetric fog as well as uh, real-time depth of field is so awesome. And then now I can click on that rock. And now the rock is what's in focus. And if I want to go back to the camera move that I already had set up in this scene, I'm just going to go back to frame one. I do, I didn't, I don't have keyframes on what's in focus. So I'm going to manually just decide that maybe the rock is in focus there. And then if I hit play, then you can see I've got this camera move. So if I wanted to, let's say, set up like a different sequence that has a different shot, um, let's do that. So I'm going to go. And let's say, go to my content drawer. I have a folder in here called sequences. So now the project that I'm working on, the project is called UE5 test, uh, which is a project I made when I decided to finally start figuring out Unreal 5. And so I've got a bunch of different levels in here that are just like different scenes. So like if I hit save all, so I'm just saving. Uh, if I go to the sort of parent directory of this project, you'll see I have level one, level two, and so forth. So like level one is the first level I made in Unreal 5 just to play with Lumen and Nanite. So if I double click on that, Lumen's going to build. This isn't anything exciting. This is just like the first level I made to be like, how does Lumen work? How does Nanite work? Um, and you can see it's just a bunch of mega scan stuff that's inside here. So if I go down here and go to level two and double click, same thing. This is now another scene that's loading. And you can see this has a cine camera actor in it. 
And so if I want to look through the shot that I set up for the camera that's in this scene, I would just go to sequences. This is level two. So I'm going to go to level two, go to the level two sequence, double click on it, select the camera. I'm going to hide UI elements by hitting G. And if I now hit play, this is the little camera move I set up in this level. And again, this is only like the second level I made with Unreal 5. Again, just super simple, but just checking out, you know, for this one, I was trying to see if uh, how do HDRs work? Does exponential height fog work with Lumen? Does it work with HDRs? Do HDRs correctly illuminate the volumetric fog? How does the skylight uh, interact with all of that stuff to create the lighting that's inside here. So it's a simple scene just to kind of test out some things that I just wanted to see if they worked. Augusto, thank you. Uh, Pixel Venture, thank you. Um, and so let's go and look, go back to, let's see, if we go to our content. So this one is level two. Level three is the one where I was just playing with uh, runtime virtual textures, I think. That could be four. Let's see. Let me save that. Yeah, this one I'm just, this was just a scene, just a, I showed this last week, just blending, material blending. Uh, let's go to four. This one I made a couple weeks ago. And so this scene. Oh, yeah, this one. That's right. Let me get the emissive material on this guy back to what it's supposed to be. Forgot that I made a change to a material that would negatively affect this shot. Let's apply that. There we go. Okay. So this is another scene. So just again, just playing. This one I was playing with instancing Megascan's assets. Um, and now let's go back to the one that we've been working on today. And now we're in here. So it's so cool with Unreal that I can have like all these different levels just in the same project and switch between them so quickly. And then I can share assets between them. So I'm going to go now onto this one. And we're going to create a new sequence for level five. And so, so I'm in level five is what's loaded, right? Yeah. So I've got a folder called sequences. In here, I've got different folders, level two shots, level four, level five. So the point of all this and what I just showed you is just so you know when you're like experimenting with Unreal that you don't need to feel like you have to make a new project for every scene you want to make. You know, it's actually makes life a lot easier if you don't, because then you can repurpose those assets. So like all of the Megascans assets I loaded already in the in this project for level one, I can use in level five instead of having to reload them all. So I'm gonna go and make a new level sequence. So I just go to sequences, level five shots. I only have shot one, so I'm gonna right click I'm going to go and make a new sequence. So I'm going to go in here to level sequence. I'm going to call this one level 005 underscore shot 02. And so I'm going to double click on it. All right. So now I have a new level sequence that's empty. So what I want to put in here is my camera. So now I could make a new camera or I could use the camera I was using before. And so if I was working on a short um, that has multiple shots, I'd probably, I definitely would make a different camera for every single shot. And so uh, we can do that in here. So right now I just have the one cine camera actor. And so, and uh, which has the correct exposure on it, which is everything else is looking a little dark um, until we fix that in a second. So I'm gonna make a new one. So I'm going to create Cine camera actor. So now we have a new one in our scene, which we're looking through right there in the lower right corner. And I'm going to rename this one. So let's rename it. 
And so this is level 005 underscore shot. Let's say cam underscore shot underscore 002. So now I've got that. So if I go to my level sequence for shot two, I'm going to now, with my camera selected, I'm going to add actor to sequence, and I'm going to add this camera. And now that that camera is added to the sequence, I can switch to the cinematic viewport for that camera. And now we're looking through a new camera in a new sequence. And so I'm going to hit G to just hide the UI elements. And so now I need to adjust exposure on this camera. So I need to select the camera. And so this is level 005 cam shot two. I can decide what's gonna be in focus. And I'm going to adjust the aperture. And so, oh, we're not looking through the right camera. There we go. Now we're looking through the right camera and we can see the depth of field. So if I select that guy, so if I adjust the aperture, then it's gonna change the lighting because you're changing the f-stop. Pixel Venture, one issue I've run into with UE5 is landscapes don't support indirect lighting. I know. That is a feature at the moment, which nobody seems to know if that's gonna change, like if that's gonna be addressed. But yeah, right now, uh, landscapes are not really supported very well in Unreal 5. And so since they don't bounce indirect lighting for Lumen, then it kind of is, means you should, if you're gonna use Unreal 5, it seems like you should probably not really use landscapes. Um, yeah, hopefully. I can't imagine it won't. And so it's just right now, you know, since I'm so in love with Lumen, Lumen is so amazing, like I don't want to go back to 4 ever again. So I'm just going to stick with 5, use Lumen, and not use landscapes until they support it. And so that means, you know, if you look at, you know, um, the Valley of the Ancients demo, there's no landscape in there. You know, there's also no foliage. So like if you open that project and look around, uh, there's no foliage and there's no landscape. So that means you're, everything's manually placed in the Valley of the Ancients. And that's fine. You know, like obviously the foliage tool is awesome and the landscape tool is awesome and hopefully they support it soon. Um, exactly. You just kind of find a way to get it to work. So, all right. So like. I made a new sequence, so the point being is like I can now figure out what shot I want to do, meaning what camera move. So I need something for us to be looking at in here, some kind of focal point. Yeah, don't want it to be that. Let's say we're just going to pan up. Now, for sort of practicing your camera moves, something that I found really useful is you can change the speed that your camera moves in Unreal. Um, and so in the upper right corner, you've got camera speed and you can set it from like one to eight. So if I put it up to eight, my camera is gonna whiz around really fast. So right now it's set to two. So you can see the speed that my camera is moving. But I don't want, and I'm just hitting A and B on the keyboard to do this, but I don't want my camera to move this fast in my shot. So if I want to preview before I start setting keys, what I can do is use A and B and scroll with the middle mouse wheel. And by scrolling with the middle mouse wheel, it changes how fast your camera moves. I only discovered this like a couple months into using Unreal because somebody mentioned it in the fellowship. And uh, it's so awesome. So if I scroll up with the middle mouse wheel, you can see my camera's moving really quick, which is useful for getting around your scene. But if I scroll with the middle mouse wheel down, I can slow the camera down. 
and use this as a way to preview what I want my camera move to be and the speed that I want it to move at. I don't know. I found it to be kind of useful. Pixel Venture. I have some huge scenes based on landscapes I got from Marketplace. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you, you can totally hack it. Um, and a, a lot of the stuff that's on Marketplace is going to have an issue. But you know, they're, they've been pretty quiet about when that stuff is going to be implemented. Hello, Sarah 3D. How you doing? So... So let's say we try a shot where maybe we're going to just, you know, move up. So I can go into Sequencer, and then I can set a keyframe on my camera at frame one. And then I want this to be 24 frames per second. So I need to specify in Sequencer that this is 24 frames per second, because that's just what I do everything at. And then right now i can see that there's this little red line on the right and that represents the sort of out point so i'm going to change things so that what i'm seeing is 250 frames i'm going to scoot that out point to frame 240 and then for my camera i also need to drag this out kind of like in premiere and now i've got 240 frames for this shot uh, I'm doing good. So continuing my adventure, trying to learn how to use Unreal, which is feels like it's moving slow, but in the scheme of things, at least it's moving. So I'm going to go scale this out. So now I'm going to go. Now, one thing that is nice in Maya that I haven't found in Unreal, and maybe somebody in here will know, is uh, like if I want to, if I'm at frame one and I want to set a keyframe at frame 240, I have to go to frame 240 and then set the key. While in Maya, I could middle mouse button drag the time marker and it wouldn't update the scene and then I could set a keyframe. I haven't figured out if there's a way to do that on Unreal. So I'm just going to go to frame 240 and then put my camera where I want it to move to. So let's say maybe the camera will move up. And then I'm going to set a keyframe on it. And so to set a keyframe in here, I just hit this little key button on the camera. And then that's it. So now I can use the little transport controls at the bottom because I'm using the cinematic viewport. So it gives you the same con con same controls in viewport that you have in sequencer. And so now we can see that I've now animated the camera. The default keyframes that you uh, get are going to be sort of ease in, ease out. So you'll notice that for these two keyframes that it starts off not moving and kind of eases in and then picks up speed and then it's going to ease out and slow down to stop at the end. But just like in any program, like in Maya, I can go in Sequencer and select the keyframe. Let's say the one that's at frame one, right click on it and I can change. So like if I put it to linear instead of auto cubic, then it's not going to have that ease in at the beginning. So it's going to be moving at full speed at the beginning and then ease out at the end. Javon, you want to see someone's workflow to composite UE4 footage over real life 4K footage? Yeah, I haven't seen that workflow yet. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of stuff with LED walls where it's in the background behind actors. And that's obviously become super popular. Uh, Sarah, advice on achieving lighting like this. This is using Lumen, and uh, which is the new indirect lighting scheme that is in Unreal 5. And so Lumen is like automatic bounce light. It's really, really user friendly. You basically turn it on. It's awesome. Unreal 4 was a lot more steps to get bounce lighting. You had to bake and that would take time and you had to fidget with it to get it to look right. Um, so Unreal 5 is what's made this a lot easier. The lighting in the scene is basically a skylight, a directional light, an HDR, environment fog, and Lumen. So if I turn off the environment fog, you'll see 
what it's going to look like. It's going to make my little fog cards look a little funny just because they're colored with a missive with a, an emissive material to match the lighting that was in the scene. So they kind of, I'd have to readjust them to make them work. So this fog made the environment very dr dramatic. Yeah, I, I definitely am a huge fan of fog. Uh, could you run Unreal with a GTX 970? I don't, I think Lumen and Nanite recommend a 1050. I think is like the min specs. But yeah, Unreal 5 is awesome. Like it's seriously like there was a lot of hype about it and it came out and I kind of put off learning it because I wanted to wait till it like was actually released. And um, I finally, like once I heard how long it was going to be until it was going to actually be, be released, because some people are saying it's going to come out in three months and some people are saying it's going to come out in a year and a half. So it's, the point is it's like months out and I just, didn't really i couldn't wait any longer and uh aaron sims did a really cool short film and uh, he said he used unreal 5 and so that kind of sold me on it being okay to switch so yeah so there's some things that are still not supported in 5 which is a bummer um translucent materials don't play well so things like leaves on a tree don't play well with lumen landscapes don't work with lumen um so it's not it's still beta but the stuff that does work is so cool that I just think it's worth the switch. So yeah, so basically what we just did is we made a new shot with a new camera. So I added a new camera to the scene. Um, so I had my original camera, I added a new camera, I created a new level sequence, added the new camera to that level sequence. So I can still go to my other level sequence and that's still in here. So this is the first shot that I did for this. And if I want to switch over to the other shot, then I can just switch over to that level sequence, which is right there. Look through that camera and then hit play on this one. So now I have two shots and, uh, and rendering them out in 2K, like in full HD with anti-aliasing, like these are 10 second shots to render them out would probably take like five minutes because you'd end up cranking up the uh, anti-aliasing settings just so it would be a little smoother. There's some uh, control variables that you can use so that you get better anti-aliasing for your motion blur and your depth of field and all that stuff. So instead of rendering in real time, it'll render take a little longer, but still like five minutes to render a 2K 10 second animation is, is really fast. Um, just looking at the comments. Been playing around with landscapes in UE5. Did not know about the indirect light caveat. Something you'll have to look into. Yeah, basically just it's it's using landscapes in Unreal 5 is problematic right now because you're not going to get lighting off of them or the bounce light. Um, nuclear, you say that Unreal's working on your 980, so that's awesome. So I mean, it's it's so hard to get graphics cards right now. So I mean, that's something that is an issue because the ones that are really good that are not you know like meaning like let's say getting a 2060 or a 2080 they're all so overpriced on ebay it's crazy david batista the thought of not having to bake anymore is so amazing i know it's like like putting up with the baking in unreal four was fine because it was still so fast compared to rendering things with maya and redshift that I still was excited by it, but it was still really finicky just like to get the lighting to look right and using reflection captures and all these different things. And it's just made life a lot easier. It's awesome not having to bake. Sarah, have I ever created lighting for an open world scene where you can transition between different times of day? Using an HDR won't work in those cases. Well, that's not entirely true. If you look on Marketplace, there's somebody who's selling um, a project that has time-lapsed HDRs. And so basically they shot an HDR over the course of like a six hour period. And you can load those animated HDRs into Unreal so that you can get time of day change. So it is possible to actually have the time of day change with an HDR. Um, 
but obviously there's a lot of overhead and there aren't that many time-lapse HDRs out there. So if you really need time of day changes, you're probably not going to use an HDR. You'll use a dynamic sky. Uh, so meaning that you'll use the regular sky atmosphere and dynamic sky system in Unreal, which is really, really good. Like there's no reason that this scene has an HDR on it. It's just how I start it. Um, it's the fastest way to like create a mood in a scene is just like load an HDR with like a really cool sky as like a start point to just get a mood for it. And, uh, but yeah, it's not like the scene really needs it. We don't even see the sky, you know? Um, any advice to start learning Unreal for ArcViz and landscape art? Uh, Unreal Epic has a bunch of tutorials that are free on the Unreal Learning uh, portal. So I would recommend checking that out. Uh, it's hit or miss on the quality, like some are really good and some are less good, but they're not super long. We just released today a new Unreal title for Unreal 5 with the Nomen Workshop, I just remembered. Um, and so let me load that up for you guys. So yes, I am now pitching a Nomen thing, but I don't do that very often, do I? So. If you head over to the nomenworkshop.com, you'll see we released this today. So creating a medieval castle in Unreal Engine 5. And so, uh, which is a pretty cool title. And so you can see just some of the, it's like from scene layout to final assembly using um, a lot of plants, vegetation, mega scans assets, texturing, So it's a pretty cool title. So you can watch the uh, preview trailer for it. I'm not going to play it now if you go to the Nomen Workshop. So that we just released. It's like an intermediate level title. Um, and so, yeah, so I, we don't have like a intro, intro level title for Unreal. Uh, that's something we're going to release next year. All right, so there you go. So yeah, so I think, again, if I wanted to render this out, which I'm gonna do, because why not? <clears throat> I'm gonna go to cinematics. That's weird, should be in here. Uh, handheld cameras for Unreal. Uh, well, you can use a iPad or a uh, iPhone as a virtual camera so that you can walk around with your iPad and record that as a camera move. Or some people like film something live action and then track it and take the track data on an animated camera and bring that into Unreal. Where is Movie Render Queue? Da, 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 da. Da, da. Okay, so I'm going to render out this little animation. <clears throat> so movie render queue is where you render stuff from. So I'm going to go add. I'm going to add. Let's do level five shot one. And then under settings, I have a preset. So you can make presets in here as well. Uh, I'll put an iPhone on a shoulder rig. Exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that there's a lot of different solutions that people are using, but obviously for handheld moves, there's actually on Marketplace, a bunch of people uh, have already animated cameras that have animation on them that look like handheld cameras that are kind of cool. I'm going to check my settings. So I've got my anti-aliasing. I'm going to lower that down just so it renders a little faster. And then this is rendering a 2K. 
I'm going to specify where I want this to go. And this is going in here. Sequence render level five shot one. But I'm going to make a new folder level five shot. O one B it in there. And then do that and that. And that should be it. And now I can render this out. So before I render, I'm going to save my project and then render local. All right, and now it's rendering, or will be in a second. Although I haven't done a render during stream so we'll see if that works OK. All right, so now it's rendering. So it's already rendered eight frames, nine, 10. So you can see it's going to take a few minutes. I mean, I've got a few programs running, and the stream is running. So I don't know if this is affecting the frame rate for the stream. But point being is that you can see that it's rendering with anti-aliasing at roughly you know, one, two, it's about a second per frame. So it's not as fast as real time. Estimated time remaining six minutes. Which I don't want you guys to have to sit through that. But uh, I don't know if I've ever canceled a render. I assume you can by hitting escape. All right, that works. I don't want you guys to have to watch that render for five minutes. So I could render it in real time if I wanted to by just turning off all the anti-aliasing settings. But in the end, all it's going to look like is what we have playing here in viewport. So cool. Well, that's basically what we're going to do today. And so we added some fog cards so we didn't make like a huge difference to the scene. But at least uh, we talked about flow map part painter. Uh, we grabbed a still in Premiere, adjusted it in Photoshop, made a flow map, added some cards in here. And, uh, well, the render is going to look like exactly like what we have up right now. And uh, there you go. And if we go over here, let's go and switch over to our other camera. And we can let this play. But I appreciate you guys hanging out with me. Hopefully today's stream was interesting, just more unreal stuff. And I kind of like the fog cards on the ground. I think they look all right. And at least I know they're working with Unreal 5. That was really like the main point of today was like, are my fog cards going to behave OK with Lumen in 5? And uh, it seems to be working. So that's awesome. So yeah, thanks for hanging out, everybody. I appreciate you guys watching. And uh, tomorrow's Thanksgiving for, for those of you in the United States. Happy Thanksgiving. Hope you have a good long weekend. And uh, everybody else, just have a good week. And I'll see you guys on Art Jam uh, next Wednesday at the same time. So there you go, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope it goes well. And there it is, everybody. Have a good evening. See y'all later. Bye.